Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephen DeMillionaire from the Complementary Currency Resource Center. I'm moderating this panel uh, <clears throat> for the next two hours. We have uh, four presentations to do. Each person has 20 minutes to present and with 10 minutes for, question, 10 minutes for questions at the end of each presentation. The first person to present is Marie Fair, Jerome Blanc, and Tristan Dissot. Socioeconomic impacts of local currencies, the case of the, of the Rue in Avignon. And the next presenter will be Leander Bindewald, Simon Mont, and Janelle Orsi. I think Leander is speaking for, on their behalf. And the subject is complementary currencies and the notion of money in the financial regulatory landscape. Uh, the third presenter is Esther Barinaga. Right? Barinaga. Land, labor, capital, solidarity, and inequality in a community currency. And the last presenter is Clara Ines Peña and Ruthie Acosta Rojas and Paulo Nicolas Carrillo. Design thinking and gamification as strategies to build a social virtual currency for adaptive healthy habits promotion in the workplace. Okay, so the first presenter is uh, Jerome Tristan. Yes, okay, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, so, I'm sorry, but we are going to present the paper, Tristan Dissou and, and I, but the main author of the paper is, isn't here. It's uh, Marie Farr, uh, who is trapped in uh, the recruitment of students in a, in a master she uh, is responsible of. Um, so, uh, we'll be only two. Uh, this is a paper on a case of local currency uh, in uh, Avignon, uh, in the southern part of France. The name of uh, this uh, currency is uh, La Roue. Um, and uh, <coughs> this uh, local currency has been implemented since uh, 2011. And in this uh, scheme, there has been uh, the development of a research uh, action research uh, within this scheme and uh, in relation to uh, the local government of the Greater Avignon uh, between November 2016 and this month. Actually, the project is not finished. Uh, this uh, local currency of uh, La Roue uh, is part of uh, a huge dynamics of creation of local currencies in France since 2010. Uh, in 2009, there were none. Uh, today, there are more than 40 local currencies throughout the, the country. You can see here a map with a, a series, I think it's not exhaustive, but a series of uh, local currencies um, uh, which were already circulating uh, late uh, out, uh, last autumn. Uh, this is in, in green what was already circulating. In red, uh, a few schemes uh, ceased to circulate. And in blue, you can see a series of projects, uh, uh, which means that there is a, um, a very interesting dynamics in, in these matters. Most of these local currencies are, however, quite small. Um, and anyway, the, uh, the purpose of the paper is not to um, think about the size of these local currencies, but uh, it, it is to think about uh, the assessment of impacts of local currencies. It's not a matter of trying to uh, assess the impact, actually. It's a matter, the paper is a matter of thinking about what are the consequences of thinking about impacts. Uh, when we think about impacts, actually, in the French cases, uh, they seem to be close to zero uh, because of uh, the very small size of most of them. Um, and the, the case of La Roue in Avignon is a small case in France, not the smallest, not the biggest, it's one of the intermediate uh, uh, schemes in France with one specificity which is that it tried to develop on various territories, uh, quite wide territories uh, across different departments in the southern part of France. 
when trying to think about impacts, actually, uh, we should have, when talking about that, a shared vision of the goals to be assessed. Because if we assess the impacts, we have to assess the impacts we want to, to, to see, we want to, to get. Who wants to get what impacts? Maybe uh, the, the goals of the local governments are not the same as the goals of uh, the issuing association. And this uh, leads to some questions about the, this, this shared or not shared vision about these impacts. And uh, one could say also that when launching a local currency, um, the associations, the not-for-profit organizations uh, that uh, launch these currencies barely plan um, uh, tools for assessment. Uh, because they face mostly uh, more pressing needs uh, than assessment uh, um, implementation and because they are fragile, because they, they don't have much uh, work, uh, work time, they, they have most vo mostly volunteers, barely uh, em paid up employees and so uh, these persons uh, rather focus on what is most pressing which is to implement the scheme, to develop uh, the, the, the number of users, number of uh, professional providers, and so on. And so assessment is maybe in everyone's minds, but not in the tools that are uh, concretely implemented. The Greater Avignon, uh, which is a, a local government that gathers a series of uh, uh, towns in the, in the area of Avignon, uh, commanded the study uh, after a pre preliminary negotiation with the issuer, with the association, on what could be this common. So there was uh, uh, something like a, a, a discussion about what could be done, actually. It's not something only uh, uh, top-down. The local government saying, I want that, it's also it's a matter of negotiating with the local uh, currency organization. And then the study should be on the impact of the complementary local currency on the territory of the Greater Avignon, but it looks for tools and not for a measure of this impact. For tools because the measure is mostly already known, is, is quite, it's close to zero. Uh, and so this will be very dangerous uh, to uh, uh, assess the impact now, uh, but it, what is interesting is to build common tools to uh, further uh, enhance the capacity of uh, the roux to uh, realize its goals. And, and then this paper is about how to build such tools and which consequences of such a study. Now a short presentation of the, the rule and the Greater Avignon. Yeah, so very, very quickly just to, to give you some figures. Um, so the local government of the Greater Avignon uh, is uh, formed uh, of the gathering of 17 uh, cities. Uh, so you have here the number of uh, inhabitants and uh, of total uh, companies uh, on this territory. Um, there's several uh, diagnoses which are made uh, of this uh, territory. So first, uh, some weaknesses and thing, things that the local, local government uh, wants to, uh, to work on. So it's firstly uh, issues of poverty and uh, unemployment, uh, which, are, which are quite high uh, compared with uh, other surrounding uh, territories. But also some strengths, uh, we may need to uh, economic sectors which are very strong uh, in this uh, territory, which are um, agriculture and uh, agri agribusiness, but also creative economy uh, around uh, cultural events. Um, in Avignon, we, we, we have a very famous theater uh, festival um, and many other uh, more, more confidential um, festivals which are really uh, drive, driving this, uh, this territory around this uh, sector of, of uh, creative economy. So the, the name of the local currency is uh, La Roue, uh, which means uh, the wheel uh, in, in French, and it was created in 2011. 
and it's, uh, it's managed by a, an association, uh, so which is called SEV, uh, which translates by exchange system to vitalize the economy. Um, so we have one main association uh, which acts as a kind of a umbrella organization with uh, at the, at the sub-level um, others, uh, subgroups, which are managing the same currency but uh, in, a, in a decentralized way uh, in the different parts of the, of the territory. So we, the, the study focus, focuses on one uh, area of this uh, wider territory. Uh, the greater vineyard is part of the area of circulation of La Roux. And in, in this part we, which we are focusing on, we have 180 uh, members of this local currency, uh, including 50 uh, businesses, which, which is not the, the total amount of businesses, which uh, it is uh, for 400 uh, in total. So um, some, some fingers, figures here to put uh, La Roux uh, in perspective with other uh, local currencies in France. I'm not going to, 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 to read all those figures, but you can see here, five minutes, okay. Uh, so you can see here, uh, the amount uh, in circulation is, uh, do we, yes, the housing money supply uh, is uh, much lower than other um, uh, local currencies you have here. Um, but Yeah, a, a few theoretical points. Sorry. About action research, but maybe I, I'm going to be very quick about that. Um, so this is a matter of combining uh, a research agent and infield action in order to propose social change and in this case, uh, two barriers uh, are faded away. Maybe they don't dis disappear anyway. Uh, a barrier between b researchers and practitioners and a barrier between researcher and the object of his or her research. And thus we can say a series of small things, but important, I think, like the following. The reality is constructed by its subjects. Uh, it's not external. Research is abductive in the meaning of peers, because it, it goes back and forth between theory and observed materials. Money, because we talk of money, appears necessarily as a, a multidimensional and embedded in the local context. It cannot be uh, considered from a, a, the unique viewpoint, for example, of uh, economics. Uh, uh, and lessons from observations are necessarily highly contextualized but they help adapt the theory. And we also, in this paper, use the actual network theory uh, that is sometimes known as the social, sociological theory of translation from the works notably of uh, Michel Callon, uh, in which translation is a process, or can be considered a process of dialogue around the common vision uh, of an issue to be solved. And interestingly, this uh, theory leads to identifying not three but four phases of translation in which you've got problematization, interestment, enrollment, mobilization, and all these stages can be uh, analyzed in the case of uh, the relationship between La Roue, uh, the local currency, and the local government of the Greater Avignon. And one of our findings is, is that translation is not uh, finalized in, in, the, in this process. And another point is that translation may induce changes in the project itself. So translation is not only a matter of uh, uh, giving a, a simplified meaning to an external person or, or organization to which we want to uh, uh, spread information. Uh, translation is a matter also of changing its our, our own representation of what we do. And in this case, uh, talking about impacts leads to uh, risks for the organization itself, for the local currency itself, because uh, having to translate its project uh, into the vo vocabulary of impacts 
this leads to change the mind of the organizers themselves about what they are doing and what is the, the key of the success of uh, the scheme. Uh, and so we have this assumption here. Um, uh, sorry, it's about dissension. Uh, okay, I don't have time about that. But the, 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 the key point here is that uh, there is a danger uh, in this translation process, process of changing the, pro the, the project itself. And we think that action research help reduce this danger, help reduce this risk. I leave you. So I have 30 seconds left. Uh, you can, yeah, just <laughs> <laughs> I won't be there. Okay, so just a few words uh, about uh, the study w that we have uh, that we started to, to carry out. So, so first, it's part of a, of a, of a framework of uh, what's called contract for the development of the social and solidarity economy, uh, which is a plan uh, for social and solidarity economy. Um, undertook by the local government, uh, involving local uh, local actors. So it's it's interesting in the, in the way that um, we have here a, a collaborative context in which the local government um, and its ma its partners uh, on the ground um, support the reflections uh, of each other um, and uh, share uh, actions uh, on on the territory. So here, uh, one of the questions that we can uh, ask is that can or could uh, the association managing the local currency uh, become a partner of this local government and uh, implement uh, some of the actions that would uh, the local, local government uh, undertook uh, in, a, in a maybe more uh, efficient way or a more uh, uh, interesting way. Um, so in this, uh, in this context, two, three uh, topics have been uh, identified. You have, uh, you have them here. Um, and from those three topics, uh, what, we, what we started uh, to do was to define uh, indicators uh, and uh, strategic scenarios. So what could be the scenarios uh, depending on the ways that we mobilize uh, the local currency. Um, and uh, also to identify uh, thresholds. Uh, so it was, a, it was a will of the local government uh, to know uh, like how much businesses do I need to have a meaningful impact, how much consumers I need to have a meaningful impact. So that was uh, something which was part of the, of the, the command. Um, so we, we organized uh, collaborative working sessions, so gathering uh, different stakeholders of the territory, people from the local as association, uh, from the local government, uh, businesses, etc. Uh, and uh, very quickly, uh, maybe some tensions that we identified. Um, so scientific points, uh, scientific needs, uh, versus political needs. So do we, do we stick to uh, a scientific methodology or do we, uh, do we speak to, to politicians and do we produce things that politicians can use? Uh, that was one of the tension. Um, so following this first tension, do we use conventional uh, indicators like uh, strictly uh, economic or for example, do we use uh, organizational indicator, indicators because um, the organizational aspect uh, of the local currency is very important in a way that the association doesn't, uh, for example, take decisions in the same way as the local government does. Uh, and it's a very important topic for the local currency. So uh, more generally, how do we account for the extra economic aspects? Uh, of the of the local currency, um, I think my time is over, right? Okay. Any so last? Any last? Uh, uh, maybe to, to conclude with this uh, with this image, uh, if we mobilize the four steps of the of the translation process, so problematization um, has been done uh, yeah, between the local government and the local currency association, identifying the three. Uh, uh, sectors, the three topics. Uh, interestment 
uh, have been re relatively weak. Uh, mobilization um, has not been uh, s uh, very effective. For example, the culture uh, theme has been uh, left aside because we didn't have any uh, stakeholders from this uh, sector. So uh, enrollment cannot for the moment happen uh, and uh, mobilization for the, for the future of the study uh, is still uh, uncertain. Okay, thank you very much, Tristan and Jerome. Does anyone have any questions? I have the microphone here. You mentioned the use of uh, economic and organizational yeah, indicators. Uh, you mentioned the use of uh, organizational economic indicators. Can you develop a little bit on these indicators and the measuring tools you have been using? Um, so we, we didn't define uh, any precise uh, indicators for this um, uh, issue of organization, uh, but it, it was something which was raised by members of the local association, uh, but as uh, it wasn't something which was part of the mandate that we received in a way for the study, uh, we didn't work on that part of the study. So. Uh, it, yeah, it's, it's not something that has been developed. Okay, anyone else? James? Thank you. Um, you mentioned that uh, it seems premature to do economic impact because the, um, because the associations are so small, they could not have much impact on the local economy. But I would suggest that looking at it the other way around can be useful. The impact the economy has on the local organizations, that can you know, be correlated. And to see if transactions increase during an economic downturn, for example, that could be, that could be very interesting and useful. So you know, just looking at the, um, the activity, different kinds of activities mm -hmm. of the organizations themselves on which there may be data. Yes, that, that's interesting. The problem being in the case of local currencies in France that uh, if we have data, this, this is on the, a few years only. Uh, you see, for example, for the Roux, it's uh, since 2011, and uh, the economic situation has been in France quite the same since, since then, one, two persons, mm -hmm. GDP and uh, quite a rising, slowly rising and then slowly declining employment. Mm -hmm. So I don't see the, the, mm -hmm. the accidents in the economic situation that could lead to observe what you mean. And maybe independently about the, from, from the time span, uh, available data is also very limited. Um, we, we know mostly about number of um, members and businesses and uh, money supply in circulation, but that's, that's about it. And what about this money supply? How, how does it flow? Uh, what do people do with it? We don't, we don't know it. So we, it's part of the study that uh, we, we undertook um, a questionnaire in which uh, during one month, uh, every uh, member is invited to, um, to record every exchange uh, from, from whom, with whom, to do what, how much, uh, in order to, to get a, a clearer picture about um, the circulation, the effective circulation about, uh, of the local currency. Okay, right. next question. Uh, thank you, that was really interesting to hear. I wanted to ask two things. Um, you're mentioning that the currency was part of the city's program also, be, also to be developing, promoting solidarity economy. Uh, was it for the currency in any way? Did you have discussions about uh, what is this other economy? Were, were, there, were there like clear out definitions or did that give a lot of rise to discussion? And then the second thing, uh, did you have to deal with taxation questions or how did you deal with that? Mm -hmm. um, yes, uh, in, in the beginning the, the cur local currency was not part of the local government uh, uh, strategy. Uh, it's after. It's, it's the process today, but it's not the case, actually. Uh, and the way the local government tries to 
take into account uh, this local currency is indeed uh, to include it in the general uh, compact, the local compact on social and solidarity economy, which refers in France mostly uh, at the, lo the local level in uh, associations, cooperatives, uh, and also mutual societies and foundations. But at the local level, it's may mostly uh, dynamics in uh, associations, no uh, not for profit, and uh, cooperatives, and mostly uh, workers' cooperatives. And on the second point, taxation, um, I think there, there were no problem because in, in the French context, uh, it has been uh, acknowledged that uh, local currencies are the same as the national or the euro uh, for uh, shops and professional providers and so on. Uh, they just have to account for their, their sales in, in this local currency as well as they account for their, their sales in euro. And so there is no problem with that. Okay, and uh, last question. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I have two, two questions. Could, could you give us more information about your data collection? And the um, second one is, uh, you talk about research action methodology, and I've seen uh, Marie Far in lots of um, local currency movements, such as in the national movement. And what's your relation between the, the local currency you study, and is there an impact on your research methodology? such as, for example, an ethnography or something like that? Such as? Uh, ethnographic studies, for example. Thank you. Data collection. Oh. Uh, <coughs> so, um, the data collection is mostly uh, the questionnaire that I mentioned. Uh, so we, we use a, an online tool, uh, Lime Survey, uh, to, to name it, uh, which allows um, consumers and businesses to to connect uh, to, to to a platform every day and to say okay today uh, I've been using that much uh, local currency uh, for this use with this partner etc. So it's a uh, it's a it's a willing act uh, of members of the local currency to to go online and to to participate in this uh, in this survey. Uh, so it's 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 underway. So we hope to have a to have a interesting results from it, uh, but we'll see uh, how much people do participate. Um, and it's, it's mainly uh, the, the, the only source of data that we, we have, uh, because we didn't have time to, to develop any other source of data. It's, it's, it's only a six months uh, study, so it's very short. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. Um, there are other other data, uh, but very, uh, um, how do we say, um, uh, basic data on uh, the number of users, and the number of uh, local providers, and, and so on. Um, but as well as in every project of such, of such a kind. Uh, with regards to research act action methodology, Marifa could tell much more than me. Uh, but I think there is difference between these between research action and ethnography, because in ethnography you you are mostly uh, external to the process, to what you observe. Uh, maybe not every every time, but this is mostly like that. I think in research action uh, action research uh, you are both inside and outside. You, you you participate to the process and you try to analyze the process with a, a, an external viewpoint. You, in your inputs, you've got uh, theories, concepts, and so on, and these concepts and theories are also changed by what you do. Uh, so this is different, I think. Okay, thank you, Jerome and thank Tristan. Uh, next, we have Leander Vindewald coming to speak about complementary currencies and the notion of money in the financial regulatory landscape. Should I announce as well? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's, totally, it's totally off topic, but um, probably my computer and a camera with a lot of lenses are both stolen in the last hour, uh, both here from this area, and um, it's just that you make sure that you keep your, your phones and your computers close by and that you don't 
leave it somewhere because there are people walking in and out that are not on this conference and we can't be certain that it's safe. And if you find it, by the way, please tell, because I still hope that we are wrong and that somebody put it somewhere so nobody can steal it, but I think it's really gone. Yeah, so keep your belongings very close uh, and your valuables even closer. <laughs> okay, Leander, thank you. Thank you. Is this? Yes, this works. So um, first, uh, a few disclaimers um, as to the abstracts you might have seen online. Um, I wanted to report on, or I will report on the research I've done recently um, in the US with Janelle Orsi and Simon Mond from the Sustainable Economics Law Center, who are named in the program but obviously are not here. Um, that's just to recognize their contribution to this research. It's also part of my PhD. Um, since the research in these three months in California took a bit of a different shape, I'm going to talk a little bit more about my PhD and less on mapping per se but there will be ample opportunity to look into this and to ask questions later, and we'll get to financial regulation landscape at least. So without further ado, there's a table of contents. So to orientate you a little bit, um, the table will come back later. It's not just a joke. Um, so it's, uh, for my PhD research, I'm just giving you a bit of a background in how I conceptualize money as a discursive institution, um, and then looking at legal definitions of money, how that then construes this financial regulation landscape and try to derive a few more practical recommendations for this audience, um, assuming this is a practitioner's advocates and academics in this community currency world, rather than maybe the audience for my PhD, whatever that might be in the end. Um, as a backdrop, nature of money um, has not much to do with what comes later. It's just curious to even observe in one author many thousand years ago, there was already a bit of a disconnect between different views on money. Um, he's often quoted from Bitcoin cryptocurrency advocates as saying he has defined that gold is the best currency and here are the criteria for it. Um, Aristotle actually never did that. The top quote that you, can you read? Yes, that's big enough to read. Um, speaks about gold in a way, but 10 years later in his ethics, he actually kind of went what is now considered the other, maybe more chartless money as a relation way saying that money is not anything that exists by nature. We make it and we can change it. And that's, of course, kind of the backdrop that I take for my um, thesis and my research. So here's the table. Um, social constructivism kind of was mentioned by Jerome with reference to Kant. Um, there might not be any rela uh, reality out there other than what we say it is. So in social constructivism, often the table is used as saying there isn't there might not be any table, even if you hit your head against it. At least we can't say anything about this table other by using words, and words and language just construes reality. And um, my thesis basically is that money is something we purely construe by the way we talk and use it, and discourse is a bit bigger in that sense than just the way we talk about it, but also our um, ways of using and dealing with it falls into this. Um, John Searle already kind of applied a similar approach, um, talking about social facts. He curiously names government, baseball, and money as examples for these social facts. And that's a great example of um, how you could then use this notion of money to look at the realities and practice of it. Um, with John Searle, there's a lot of things to say about how he then views money and what examples he gives and what problems he discovers. Um, in my view, by kind of not quite fully understanding how money operates at the moment in terms of uh, the relationship between <coughs> paper money, fiat money, electronic money, and the intricate systems between central bank money and um, the uh, money that we use with our credit cards. But that is just a side note, and there will be more in my thesis for this if you ever get hold of that next year. Um, the next theoretical backdrop for this is then new institutionalism kind of coming from, yes, it's a social construction, but um, new institutionalism is quite useful add-on to this saying that um, money as an institution is something that just shapes our behavior, but at the same time is also shaped by our behavior. And I always find this quote quite useful saying that um, we might not be using the money as we know it because we, anybody would consider that to be superior, but mostly because we also don't quite know about alternatives, which is not true in this audience, of course, but out in the world. That is one factor. And then coming to the final standard saying it's a discursive institution, again, shaped by 
well, shaping the way we um, interact with each other and how we talk about it by the money as it is at the moment, but also being shaped by the way we do this. And this discourse we're having right here in this room and this conference, of course, also tries very deliberately to change how money is in the world out there. And um, this uh, idea of discursive institutionalism thus gives a notion to look at, at money as an institution as it is, but also looking at the same process in shaping and changing this money. Um, if I say this, there is another methodological and theoretical backdrop to how I go about my work and my thesis, which comes from more like a linguist side and critical discourse analysis, particularly then looks at different um, players and authors in this discourse having different um, power, basically. And of course, there's then also always a play of power and um, uh, exertion of interest in this discourse. This is a screenshot from a YouTube video by the Bank of England um, curiously actually talking about um, the paper they wrote in 2014 saying money has nothing to do with gold is issued by commercial banks when they make a loan. They shoot the summary video in the vault of the Bank of England with a view of all these gold bullion behind them. Them doing that with wearing a suit and a tie of course has a very different position in this discourse in a different weight than us going out there and saying there's slats, there's time banks, there's all the other things. Um, also curiously a paper that says money has nothing to gold, uh, do with gold then being summarized in front of all these bullion um, lends itself to a critical analysis of saying why would they show gold if they try to convey that it has nothing to do with it. And there's a lot more to be said about it. But um, then looking at um, the data to my research basically is just these publications by financial regulators in the UK and um, in the US from working with uh, Janelle Orsi in California and trying to find out how do they actually define money then. This is a very famous tweet also in 2014 where they just said most money is created by commercial banks. But if you then read the paper that um, is behind that money in the modern economy, um, they try to come to a notion of what money is and to try to define that, but basically um, summarize it saying, um, despite the, its important and widespread use, there's no universal agreement on what money actually is. Um, and that would be fine even if central banks would have that notion. And it's, this is not only the Bank of England. You can find that um, reflected in what other central banks say on the matter. Um, but unfortunately, when it comes to our practice, there are um, problems with this. Um, this is, well, it's just black for you. Uh, this is a picture of Will Roddick in the prison in Kenya. Um, he only spent one night in prison, and uh, you're presenting on uh, his project tomorrow. Um, so him having to go to prison even just for one night and having to fight the authorities um, basically just came down to them not really knowing what he is doing, what the Bangla Pesa is, what these community currencies are, assuming from their vague understanding of money that it must be fraudulent and illegal somehow. And um, I mean, he got out of it quite fortunately with letters of support by the local governments apologizing and saying, no, we were wrong, you were right. Um, but for other initiatives, this is a huge hurdle, this um, gray area and blind spot in regulation. Um, even successful ones like the Bristol Pound, for example, continues has this sword hanging over them um, of the authorities, never really being able to assert that what they're doing is legal or falls into any category of licensing, but really just not having enough of a, an idea there. So in the US, I try to look at the financial regulation landscape, looking at all the laws that are there, um, and trying to figure out what is what, so to say. Um, that wasn't as easy as we expected, and even the lawyers, Janelle and Simon, sitting next to me, just kept shaking their heads. Um, what, here are a few slides on what we did find. So on the one hand, the objectives of regulations as they are articulated, and of course you can go about and look if those objectives are actually really pursued by the regulatory and um, legal process, but they are they look rather benign, so stabilizing the industry, the financial industry, but also supporting monetary policy, which speaks towards stabilizing the economy overall, preventing fraud, of course, protecting consumers is a big thing, and there are curious numbers of laws actually promoting inclusion and fair lending and community investment, and all that falls into a wider landscape. Um, but um, the institution that actually then governs this and enforce these laws and come up with these laws um, are complex and fragmented, and that's not our language. That is actually the a paper from the Governmental Accountability Office in the U.S. saying our regulatory financial regulatory landscape is quite messy. So this is just a graphic of theirs of all the different regulatory bodies. Um, 
and the institution that sit underneath there, and even, uh, yeah. So if we, even, even if you look at the institution as they are now, that just doesn't quite apply so easily to anything. At the moment, basically, if you talk to professionals and regulators, there is this distinction between banks and non-banks. Um, that's the basic thing there is at the moment. When we say banks, um, we probably all have an idea in our minds, and that is part of also the critical discourse analysis, and then thinking, okay, if we see big glass skyscrapers and think of banks as such, what about credit unions? What about local banks? Which are, what about these very small, benign institutions that operate so differently? And then on the non-bank side, there's a whole boohoo of things happening at the moment. FinTech is often um, hyped up as a big counterweight to the banking system. Of course, we are part of this non-bank system or, or these community currencies. Are you keeping my time? Great. Um, this line going through the middle is actually something that um, we then developed, or not developed, but applied again at the Sustainable Economics Law Center, drawing a, one line across this whole landscape or field saying, it doesn't really matter so much bank, non-bank, it matters much more how they are governed. So there's the shareholder-orientated institutions. Um, it's sometimes easier to say for profit, but that doesn't match so well, or commercial. So you have institutions governed by investors who want um, a share, um, a profit out of it, and your stakeholder oriented institutions, which then is a very broad category encompassing everything from non for profits, from non profit associations, from governmental agencies and initiatives, but also cooperatives, even though they are commercial and for profit often, at least do serve their customers in a very different way, and customers and clients and members and cooperatives is often the same th thing. So, by their nature, they are just very different institutions and they operate very differently. So the notion then being that um, you should, of course, also regulate them differently, but we'll get back to this. Just talking about banks and the, the discourse of that a little bit, it's also curious to just look at where this notion comes from. And uh, in the US, many of the big household name um, brands, so to say, Wells Fargo, American Express, you, of course, have these images in mind, but it's often very little reflected that they actually came from logistics companies, so they were actually just hauling parcels across the country, and while money was just paper, um, hauling parcels across the country and doing banking was very close and actually developed in these companies as pretty much the same thing. Wells Fargo, um, there is very good articles about the history of Wells Fargo where you then see that just by volume of business, they split in San Francisco and had two buildings for these two different businesses, one was banking, one was um, logistics. The, the transport company went down. Um, the bank is now what we know, and the same for American Express. And strangely, um, the law never developed any better notions of that other than describing how these banking businesses operate. When the um, um, National Bank Act came out in 1856 in the US, they didn't say a bank is this and that's what they do. They just described how they go about it, but the line in law basically says a bank is what a bank does and never really reflects. There's the one definition that is a bank is a depository institution, but again, taking the notion of the bank is primarily a deposit creating institution makes all these definitions not so easy to work with. Um, to the notion of money here, just a few examples. Oh, they're big enough to read maybe. Um, so basically just, um, how much time do I have, Stephen? All right, so uh, I'm not going to read these out, um, but maybe you can read them while you listen to me slumbering you into a post-lunch um, sleep. Um, just goes to say that the definition of money often really appeared to be really recursory, so you have one definition um, trying to get clarity on something, but then you have the next law, the next statute that seems to contradict it or, or again, make it so broad and open that there is no clear uh, line to be drawn. So if um, issues for complementary current practitioners come down to saying, are you money, are you not money? It is not so easy to argue one way or the other. So in these one, money is a relative broadly deformed thing, um, which would go to really the question if, if these would then count as money. If you go a bit more concrete, and Bitcoin, for example, brought up this question, and it's often regulated as such, saying, I, do you need a money transmitter license if you operate with Bitcoin? When you look at these things and then it says trans money transmission is a transmission of currency funds and other values substituting for currency. You, of course, then go to look what currency means, and that is defined in the US and in the UK explicitly as notes and coins. So, of course, Bitcoin and all the other currencies that operate in an electronic form wouldn't fall under the thing of 
currency, and strangely then wouldn't be money transmitters, but that's not a line that is easily argued. Um, with Janelle and Simon, we agreed in the end that yes, this is all inconsistent and wouldn't stand, but again, it's really hard to argue that in court and make a case of it. Um, I'm going to skip this. Legal tender is often is also a thing that as banks and money people assume they know what it is and has a value and authority, but if you read even the text from the Treasury, it kind of comes down to not meaning much. Um, as we heard so much about topologies, I left this slide in my presentation just to give a way of talking about it, which then also takes us to the conclusions. I often say money with a capital M meaning the concept, the idea of money, the platonic idea, and that is the biggest um, circle there. And in this, there's a whole lot of currencies that are implementing the idea of money in one way or another. And there, I don't say complementary currencies, but I actually include money as we know it, so dollars, yen, and euros, as just one way of implementing the idea of money. And that, unfortunately, is money with a small m, money as we know it, and as we had it in our pockets since we were two years old and went to buy our first sweets. And community currencies are just a certain subset of those vaguely defined, but um, often just very different from all these other currencies that we see there. Um, if it comes to conclusions from this, again, as I said before, we would love to see a, a differentiation between shareholder-orientated and stakeholder-orientated institutions. So local banks, governmental, public banks, um, ethical banks wouldn't have to be complying with the same rules that apply to Deutsche Bank and commercial uh, and Commerzbank in Germany was one of the big ones or Barclays or Wells Fargo because they are operating very differently and thus pose less risks to anybody, the collective, the society, the system and the individuals. And um, one thing that is already happening a little bit but that should happen more of is actually looking at the functions rather than the institutions. So um, we defined basic financial functions as being liquidity, having enough money in circulation, payments, being able to make payments um, with each other and with businesses, borrowing and saving being different from liquidity because it's not about creating new money but having a way to actually put money aside and access other people's money um, and insurance. For businesses then the fifth um, thing would be to issue bonds and access capital that way. But again those can all be done with in very different institutions should be regulated in different ways. Just uh, what is happening right now kind of peek into this world, even the regulators aren't so clear about that. Um, the uh, New York State financial regulator is suing the Office of the Control of the Currency currently because the, this OCC was, um, is the uh, institution that grants national bank charters in the US. They recently said, hey, we can make new charters for these fintech companies who want to be payment systems which would mean you have a, something called a bank license, a special purpose bank license for something that is actually not a bank because it doesn't create money and the state regulators are, well, they actually took them to court now saying that is not what a bank means and we have to do something different. Maybe just to round it up, uh, you can read all the rest. Gun butter means good luck and try your best at the bottom, um, but just to say the top recommendation is just be very clear in your language. Um, of course, you have to be clear as practitioners in your language to your audiences to sell your currency to your, to your idea, but um, if you engage with regulators, you have to also be care careful not to mix things up more than do because um, now is the time to engage with this. Once Google and Amazon and Facebook come into the space and bring their lawyers with them, they will define money differently very soon, and that might, is most probably to, to your detriment. So engage in this conversation now. Thank you, Leander. Any questions? Okay, I'll do, I'll do this one first, and then two, okay. Um, fascinating project, Leander, really, to li oh, can you hear me? Yeah, fascinating project, it was really interesting to listen to, and I don't really have a question, but more of a suggestion maybe, um, if you heard about he Douglas Holmes, um, this is an anthropologist, and he did research on uh, central banks in Scandinavia, and the one in Germany as well, and he's written a book called The Economy of Words, it kind of describes what you are doing in um, the sense that these central bankers know what um, their words or how they describe money or how they describe the future of what will happen in their policy briefs, what it does. So they are very much aware of the performativity of economics and they use it to shape economy uh, in a way. So that might be interesting for you to look at. 
please send me again later. I haven't heard of him yet. Yeah. Thanks. Hi. Can you hear me? Uh, if you speak right into it. Um, I would like to know if you think that having a definition of money that bridges both like the national currencies and complementary currencies together in one united definition is very important to, for the recognition of complementary currencies? Or like how would you, or like what, how would you go around to create a framework that encompasses both? I don't know if you understand me. I don't know what you mean with both, but um, maybe. Like to right now we have like, you know what people, when people talk about currencies, they mean national currencies. And the money in itself doesn't really have, like you said, a clear definition. Mm. Do you think that establishing a clear definition of money is like the right path to promote complementary currencies? Or? And, and they, they, no, there might be a conflict of interest for the practitioner as the way they speak to their audiences, to their, to their customers, to the businesses. I mean, even the business to business barter industry very much likes the idea of barter and goes about um, adhering to this wrong myth of barter as the origin of money because they like to say, and we still do barter just better, um, even though it has nothing to do with barter. So they, oftentimes the way you t talk to your clients will lead you astray, will get you into a definition that is actually factually wrong and won't help you if you need to um, engage with the regulator. So to your first question, how I would go about it is actually saying money is only a concept. Um, and leave this out that doesn't need a definition um, that is really broad and might be too fuzzy at the margins to actually encompass. What you might want to define is currencies and there it would be good if currencies would not only mean notes and coins anymore because that's way too limiting in a world where most transactions are electronic in, in, in complementary currency and in national currencies. But uh, my definition of currency is then any unit system that facilitates f collaboration in a community. Again, very broad, and, but then you can ask the question, what kind of collaboration do you try to achieve? Is this commercial and potentially exploitative or is it actually benign and collaborative? What kind of community are we serving? Are these people fully, are these of age and can decide for themselves and all you need is contractual law to regulate this? And, and who are you trying to introduce this unit? Are you a government, are you a private enterprise? And differences will be made. But um, it will be pretty impossible to find a more concise, shorter, more narrowing definition that will actually encompass it all. So there is a bit of a problem at the moment that I can't give a better, or nobody can find a good definition to give this all a sense and still engage in this bigger definition, uh, in this bigger process of changing money as it is and nudging the regulator to recognize this. Which is a problematic thing for all these presentations we hear here about typologies. I'm, I know how attractive it is to come up with typologies for what we do and then somehow find how mo national money fits into this, but that might actually create more of a problem long term. Thank you. Oh, sorry, just for you to take a picture of it. Hi, I'm Gilson Schwartz from Brazil at the University of Sao Paulo. And uh, I'd like to, to add or maybe ask one uh, specific focus when you connect money to language, and it, that is the audiovisual dimension, imagetic or iconic dimension. We've been working uh, quite a lot in that perspective, and it brings about an affective dimension, even a bodily relation to money. As so many of us have seen over the years, Eloisa Primavera playing with uh, children and women and people with uh, like token or even looks like a toy or a game. So I would like to listen a little bit and mm -hmm. ask you about this particular perspective of Monet as media, and media as an icon that involves affective perception, not only rational calculations, strictly speaking. That goes back maybe to Zerli. So I hope my theoretical frameworks are open for this. Um, I don't focus on this because that's not my background. I wouldn't know where to start with this, but social constructivism and discourse and critical discourse even does not only talk about words ever. That's, that's the narrow meaning of discourse that I'm not adhering to. So it's part of it. It's just not my ability to do that. Um, I just Hi, wanted Mary. to ask if you're familiar with the positive money campaign in, in the UK. 
And uh, what's happened to the founder of that campaign? Uh, yeah, it has little to do with my presentation, but I'm very knowledgeable about them. And Ben is now at the Bank of England in the digital currency research team with Michael Kumhoff, which is great news, but also, again, will make it very much necessary for us to know what we are talking about when the Bank of England creates very different realities with a national issued digital currency. I have actually a, a comment. It's a, maybe a pretty simple definition of money, which is important for our context. For me, money is what is issued or created by a bank with the permission of the government. And, um, and then you can change your money into bananas or complementary currencies and, and buy something if the other one agrees to accept this. So then it's a currency, but the money is this issued by a bank with governmental permission. All the other stuff is currency. So that's why we always talk of um, complementary currency and not of complementary money. Well, unfortunately, there's no we that speaks with any coherence in this room even. Um, maybe you do that, but, and that might be a good way. Um, these definitions, as you mentioned, it come up in the law sometimes, but then are contradicted by the next law. So. As I said, I don't think there is any good definition that we have come up with yet, and we may need to make it vague enough to be defendable instead of trying to narrow it down to something that makes sense to us and how we speak about it might mean nothing to anybody else. Melina, just speak up. I'll, I'll repeat your question. That, sorry, thanks for this. That brings a very important point up um, at the very end. If I talk, if, if I say these things, I'm quite aware that actually following through with this might pose a problem to institutions that have found a quite comfortable arrangement with the regulators. So, um, of course, language-wise, saying it's a barter currency is an oxymoron. It doesn't make any sense. These companies are quite well established now as saying, no, we're not money. With every new law, with Bitcoin being regulated, Erta has to go back to the regulator and say, and make sure we're not included in this because we're something else, right? For the business, it's good as money. If you take a functional definition, they are issuing something very akin to money. There, there wouldn't be any clear line to be drawn. But if if my approach to regulation comes through, they would have to redefine and reposition themselves, which of course would be a shame to them because they are quite comfortable. But long term, it would be good to find an arrangement that doesn't only work for the commercial barter industry, but actually is open for innovation in that as well. But I'm, yes, I'm always sorry to say these things knowing that how much Annette and other people have fought exactly for this. Oh, they are. But um, yes, but and yet, functionally, they might serve quite a similar thing. <laughs> Glad we don't okay. have to rule on it. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Thank you very much, Leander. <laughs> Next, we have Esther Barinaga. Thank you. Esther is speaking on land, labor, capital solidarity, and inequality in a community currency. Um, 
Okay. So I'm. Um, oh, I'm going to talk a, lot, a, a little bit about a particular community currency. So it's a, it's, it's, this presentation is more similar to the first one we had today, in that it presents one particular case. It's, however, a different type of currency to the one we had on Lahu. It's uh, this one is a mutual credit currency. And. Um, and uh, the, the starting point of my discussion is in the debate that there is a, among us here in the, at this conference, the agreement is that uh, local currencies promote values of solidarity, of uh, fairness, of equality, of care, uh, all these kind of pro-social behaviors that, the, that we so much want to see. But at the same time, we have a body of uh, critical scholars, few however, but uh, heavy in the sense of how they define the theory about money, that say, well, local currencies are just reproducing the inequality we have in our current conventional system, and so they are really no tool to achieve an alternative way of organizing our societies. So it is to this debate that I want to uh, give a short analysis of a particular currency. Okay? And um, it's the, the study is based on a half-year ethnography, if you want, of, a, of a, the commune, which is a currency, small currency, in southern Spain, in Malaga. Um, and uh, the theories I used to discuss it are actually emerged from my fieldwork. It's not a theory that I had worked beforehand and I'm imposing on my data. It's actually uh, concepts that were discussed, maybe with a different wording, uh, but were discussed quite often and regularly at uh, users' meetings, at local fairs, at the communal lunch, Wednesday's lunch, at, uh, you know, whenever we had a workshop, whatever. Issues of debt, of shame, of appropriation, and of providing services were routinely discussed. And mainly what was very often discussed was actually the, the ratio. They didn't use these words, but they often said, oh, he's producing more than I am, or how can I produce more so I can, right? So it's always a, an issue of balances, but also of produ production of services. And so um, I, with that field work in mind, I went back to theories. I'm, I'm a sociologist by background, so this is a completely new theoretical field for me. And, uh, but I went back to theories of the economy that are based on fieldwork too, and that also came with notions of community, the commons, uh, balances of how much you provide to how much you appropriate, and things like that. And, and, and mainly, uh, Elinor Ostrom, the Nobel Prize economist um, uh, that died recently, um, uses concepts that help us very much understand what these users were going through. Have you heard about the commons? Should I go into um, go, uh, Eleanor Ostrom? Should I go through that theory? Or I just can assume that you know it and, uh, yeah? So it's, it's the idea that common goods, we've assumed that uh, they need, because of the tragedy of the commons, that it, the only solution to it, they need to be governed uh, either by the market or the state. And she said, look, I've traveled around the world and I've seen that common goods such as the rivers or the grazing fields or, uh, are actually can be sustainably governed in smaller scale through communities, right? And you need to set up particular governance structures. Uh, that's what I say. In her theory, and I'm, I'm not gonna go into the details of the theory then, it's just assuming a different kind of individual behavior that is not only uh, rational utilitarian, but also cooperator. But in this theory, there is a very interesting distinction that helps us understand the dynamics of balances and appropriation and, and provision in a, in, a, in a currency system. And is the distinction between system, a resource system, and uh, the flow of resource units. And to put her in her language, in a, in a in a river, the system would be the river. And you need a healthy river so that there is uh, quite a lot of flow of fishes, which would be the units, okay? In a currency system, the few, the few papers that have been written using this theory assume 
the units to be the monetary units and the currency system to be the, the mutual credit system or whatever platform the money, the local currency is based on. And I, my argument is, well, the units is, are not the monetary units. The units, actually, the resource units are the units of labor, of services, of <coughs> products that are generated thanks to the, in this case, the mutual credit system. So the currency system, the resource system, the lake, if you want, the grazing, the grazing field, will be the mutual credit system, whereas the resource units would be not the communes, which was the name of this currency, but actually the hour of labor, the car that I can rent, the hour of dancing classes, wh whatever it is that, you, that, that is generated in the community. And this has a benefit, and is that it returns value to work, not to an agreement that, or, or, or something that we've agreed to use as a unit of exchange. Okay, so that's what it says. It's uh, very clear in one of the, the founders of Malaga Comun puts it very clear when he says, when they, they started the currency in um, 2010 in Malaga, which is a, a city in southern Spain, in Spain that has suffered deeply the, the, the current crisis or the current, the crisis, the economic crisis that started in the 2008. And he says, well, the problem with crisis is that money doesn't move because we tend, to, those that have it and can do it, hoard it. And those that have, don't have it, don't have it, so they don't worry anyway. But money doesn't move and that jobs are lost. That doesn't mean that people without a job do not have anything to offer to society. That would be the resource units, right? What they have to offer to society. It means that there is no money to pay for their services. Since times long forgotten, people have exchanged goods and services without money mediating. Today, internet helps us here. It is a great way to get goods and services. That is actually the units that are seen as resources, the goods and services without spending money and yet paying with all the good things that we have to offer. Okay, so just to support that distinction. Uh, the methods, so based on field work from January to June last year, uh, I've collected all meetings from the general assemblies of this community since 2015. I've been involved in formal, informal and more formal discussions with individual users. I've been a participant, a, a, an active participant in the currency, selling services and, and buying services. Uh, yeah, and then I've assorted a wide array of different texts from promotion videos and uh, brochures, websites, blogs, all that kind of fieldwork material we're used to. Uh, this is the background for the startup of the currency, at a, the height of the economic crisis in Spain. This is where unemployment, yeah, unemployment rates very much, and uh, the same for Malaga, which is a way to tell you that uh, the, the, the users that got attracted to the currency were in this particular one, where middle class, the impoverished middle class, uh, the young, hyper educated that could never enter the labor market, and one wonders whether they'll be able to do it. Um, the working class that has seen their labor conditions get worse or have lost any possibility to actually make a living. So it's a mix of, of classes and of um, ethnic backgrounds, if you want, but mainly social class, socioeconomic classes. And they're starting to exchange things. And if you want to look at the dynamic in the system and between users and the system, uh, you need to look at two kinds of relationships. One is the user's relation with the system itself, with the currency system. The other one is the user's relation to the units Right, which we've seen is the labor and the time put in it or bought. Okay, so it's not money or the, the units of currencies, but the labor. And if you look at the user's relations to the resource system, you see that it is a system that is built, it's designed and built and promotes an ethics of solidarity where everybody is invited to the General Assembly to make decisions that have to do with money should we grant credits or not? Should we put a, a limit to the debits that people can do? I mean, these are monetary 
high-level policy decisions, if you want, only it's done at a small level. But they are also taking, and this is everybody, you know, there's no hierarchy, there is not a board, everybody's invited to the general assemblies. Um, they are also taking decisions, organizational decisions. Small things like when to organize a fair, how often should we meet, or to more, you know, distributing responsibility or whatever. So in that sense, the system promotes a behavior of equality and a recognition that everybody can, can contribute to the maintenance and the strengthening of the currency system. Now, the problem comes when you look at users' relationship with the resource units. And remember, resource units, and I, I'm repeating it again, because, at least with my colleagues at Copenhagen Business School, I'm having a trouble with this. They only see value in money. It's quite amazing, actually. They, 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 they've stopped seeing value in labor. But, um, and here is the resource units is, is labor. Or, the time you, or the products you, you can exchange, right? And when you look at users' relationship with resource units, you have to look at two types. So one is appropriation, so when they're um, buying things, and the other one is provision, and it's, that's when they're selling things to the community, right? And they're here, they, that's when the tragedies come in. <laughs> so if you look at appropriation, uh, we have Blank as example, a highly educated, two degrees, two languages, Spanish and English, a woman in her 30s in Malaga who won't be able to have a stable work given the current economic system. And she's buying a lot of uh, products just to be able to have dinner every day. And so she's incurring a, um, quite a deficit. Um, which some users started to see as well. She's a free rider. She's buying a lot. The same with Manuela. Well, she's, you know, she's consuming a lot, but she's not providing as much. And if you look at the system itself, well, at an individual level, we can use those sort of moralizing language where someone is free riding on the system. But if you look at it at a systemic level, it's actually helping the system to generate units to exchange, right? They are generating, they are helping the farmers to sell their products, they are helping the, the Manuela is renting an apartment or renting a room in an apartment, they're helping things, a variety of things to be there, to be exchanged in the community system. So from a systemic level, this is no problem. And we can discuss the moral aspects of it, but from a systemic level, it is not. But it is, however, a problem from a systemic level is the ego who's renting her two rooms in her, in his, uh, it's bigger than an apartment actually because it's in the outskirts of Malaga, it's a small farm. He's renting two rooms and without doing anything, he wakes up and he has 400 comunes every month, right? 200 for one room, 200 for the other room. So he is giving, <coughs> providing rental rooms to the system, but one thing, in a way, or, or two if you want, but it gives him, and everybody sees him as, wow, how a wonderful person he is. He's actually renting his rooms when he, in, in communes when he could rent it in euros, but yet it's, it's creating a, an imbalance of appropriation and provision because without doing a thing, he has a, 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 purchasing, pow, a purchasing power, a capacity to, to, to buy that, you know, that overwhelms all other users. And he's using it in a very solidary way, but the fact that he owns a house in the conventional economy, when translated into the community economy, is the source of an inequality in the community economy. And so with the communities that he's accumulating, he's been able to renovate the house, to farm his small garden, to and still accumulate. And he's spending them in a solidary way. He looks when he go, goes in and looks at the account balances for different users, he looks at those that have less or that are more in debit and buys the services for them. So it's not that he's a mean, greedy capitalist, but there is a source of inequality that is rooted in the conventional economy that is being translated into the com community economy, right? And this is something that I would like to discuss and that I haven't seen discussed in papers or in research on community currencies, and is the notion of ownership. 
that we is almost sanctified in our system, and we're not discussing it here. And, and I find it a, it's a forum, it's a, a, a space where we're starting to discuss different economic alternatives and different sources of inequality. So it's, it's a space that invites for that sort of reflection. Two minutes, then I'll go straight to this one. So land, the old, the old uh, resources, uh, or the old uh, origins of inequality in the conventional economy that has been analyzed since, I don't know, since Marx at least, land, labor, and capital are actually the sources of inequality in the community economy as well, right? Where those that own land or property and, and have skills that are more scarce, doctors, dentists, computer programmers, right, have a way to live from the wage labor of others that don't have those skills. And so you're introducing inequality into the currency. It's a solidarity inequality because they, there is an ethos of solidarity in the currency. But, and so I'm just wondering <coughs> that where, whether we should actually be talking more about how to, maybe not to do away with property because the lady that is living in the rental room is actually very thankful that she's able to rent in communes, right? So not getting away with property, but maybe how could we design a system that manages inequality in a way that is not to the detriment of the system? Am I okay with time? Okay, so two or three, three of the suggestions. Are, they are, these are not new suggestions. I mean, they are there, and different currencies have been doing it, them at the, to different degrees. And we have the demos there that is actually working with this in very actively. But one would be tax on, on earnings coming from property. The other would be a hoarding tax or demurrage or oxidation, or however you want to call it. That is a, a tax on an account balance at given points in time, which redistributes again whatever earnings, wherever from they're coming. And then a redistribution system through the basic income um, ideas which would be an excellent place where to test basic income notions. Thank you. Okay, questions. Yes, I'll go over there. There were two. I don't run as fast as Miguel does, sorry. Uh, my name is Steph Kappers, I'm from Belgium. Um, it's, there's just one question where which is it's not really clear do you do you want to get rid of all equality uh, inequality or do you just want to limit it to a, to a uh, certain uh, certain degree that, because that is a, yeah yeah because there's this one thing because it, I, I think that if you want to get rid of all inequality then um, you also need to get rid of, of money or different uh, difference in wages because so um, or you have to um, quantify every piece of labor, including taking care of your parents and taking care of your children, because that is work that you're doing that is actually contributing to the community. So it's, it's kind of a complex system. So my, back to the basic question is, do you want to get rid of all, all inequality, or do you just want to limit it to a certain range? No, I think we need a discussion. I'm, I'm not going to tell you a lot, uh, you know, a, a solution for, for everything. But, and, but I, I think that's something we need to consider. And if, and if as some of these currencies want, I mean, the purpose is to promote more equalitarian economies, then we need to discuss the sources of inequality. And they are at the moment translating the sources of inequality in the conventional economy into the community economy. So they need to at least be aware that they exist. And then they can decide whether they tolerate it whether there is a, a certain amount of inequality that is actually beneficial for the system, as some economists argue, or whether we actually, you know, want to get, yeah. So I'm open to a dis I guess that the answer is, let's talk about it. Yeah. Hi, um, thank you so much for this, uh, for this paper and presentation, and thank you for raising the question because um, uh, actually, I have the same complaint from the community that we don't discuss inequalities and structural um, uh, ways that inequalities are reproduced or enhanced within community um, mm. currencies or parallel currencies. And uh, 
uh, I can share with you that for years now I try to discuss this. No one, it's not that they don't discuss, it's just that we don't want to discuss this topic. And my paper for this conference is about that, is about class analysis and how it is missing, especially uh, since 2000 onwards in our literature. So my question to you is um, because I am against all types of inequalities, and I also uh, don't want only to mitigate inequalities, I want to erase inequalities. So my question is how, we, what um, theoretical approaches or what analytical tools can we use to design better currency systems that, not they, that they are not neutral to the inequalities we have mm. already, mm. like inequalities in land ownership or in educational skills, mm -hmm. because this is also my question. And uh, I'm asking because there are some, um, some analytical tools we have from, uh, from uh, it's not only Marxist theory, I mean also, I, I, um, although I appreciate very much Marxist analysis, but I think, I mean, the question is, what would you use in your question in uh, the common uh, yeah, and currency? Common. And what would you suggest for us? So, um, actually, I love theory, but a lot of theory, unfortunately, is not grounded on empirical studies or empirical evidence. We have, though, Ostrom's economic theories that are extremely sociological and ethnographic or anthropological, whatever term you want to use. And I've, as far as I've played with those concepts, uh, th those have been the most useful, actually, to see. So one of the suggestions or the recommendations she gives is actually to, to have not only, so in most currencies, for, inst for instance, they have a, a debit limit. Not all have a credit limit. Uh, there is, and she, if we translate her advice, she, we would have a symmetric. It would be a, a, a way of controlling the ratio of appropriation or so of credit and, and, and provision, debit, right? Um, so, so looking at it, again, at a systemic level, not at an individual level. And credit limits and debit limits are most often looking at the individual level. But if you look at the ratios, then it can give you a key. But it would be playing with Eleonora Ostrom's uh, ideas, actually, I find. Um, thank you. J just to know if you discussed the free proposals with the people uh, you, uh, you, you made, the, you observed, um, the, the ones I put as an example here. Yes, the, the, yeah. Yeah, the, the free or the group, anyway. Uh, or is this just your proposals? I mean, oh, sorry, I the, didn't understand the, the free proposals, the free, the free possibilities, the free practical suggestions. Here, yeah, tax on earnings, yes. hoarding tax. Is this yours or uh, is these proposals or suggestions from the people of the commune? Uh, or is the this hoarding tax that has, has been, been one from the people of the commune, from one two users from people of the commune. The redistribution has been me talking with uh, Miguel Angel and with other people that are actually, you know, uh, not maybe into community currencies, but that are thinking about redistributive methods um, where I live. Uh, I mean, this comes from discussions elsewhere, and it, and it needs to be tested empirically. But some currencies are already experimenting with it. Thank you. Hi, my, my, can you hear me? My name is Numa. Um, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Numa. Um, talking about social currencies and social economy, there's another aspect uh, besides uh, ownership of uh, proper property, or it is related to, to this, is um, considering employment, having employees, paying employees, uh, it's a debate we can open about uh, is it fair to have uh, to pay employees, I mean to, to sell a product with a social or a community currency and, and paying employees and keeping part of the, of the social currency. Um, I, I, I don't want to expand too much on, on the debate, but uh, in terms of equality, we can talk about um, how employees, what is the part of the employees, uh, the retribution level. If, uh, if you give them a, sal a salary, 
it's not the same as, as if you share the benefits of the company. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's what I mean. So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, but then you're discussing property and ownership. Yes, and you, it you is too. You go into a co-op model. Yeah. But it's also mm -hmm. very interesting. And, uh, yeah, that's it. She's been here. I have a very technical question, and this goes with the conversion mechanism. How, uh, if I get some uh, money in this community cur currency, in some, uh, can I spend them in the outside world? No. You can, you can spend it with those that are ready to sell to you in Comunes, right? And uh, there are a couple of shops in Malaga that accept, com that accept Comunes, uh, but that's it. Well, uh, uh, well, and then among them, they are farmers, they are, you know, they are massage, they are electricians, there are people that build oh, uh, solar ovens, I've been renting cars, you know, you can buy heaps of things there. But they're not all formal shops, if you want. Uh, yeah. But it's a completely transparent currency, so the problem they were having in, with La Rue in France, in Lyon, or whatever that currency is, uh, that they didn't know how to get to the transactions, I go into the network and I can see the transactions from the year they started, 2010, for every single user. When they spent it, what they spent it to, whether the, the, the person that bought it was happy with it or not, there's complete transparency about that. So you can actually choose who to sell or to buy from, if you want, so in that sense it's very transparent. Yes, okay. Yes, I have a microphone. <laughs> oh, yes, yes uh, Esther. Um, I'm very grateful also for your research. Actually, I find it fascinating. Mm -hmm. And indeed, because we are, I think we are focusing on currency and money and so on, but not on the products. Yeah, so I think this is a fascinating research. And of course, if you take currency as an accountancy system, <laughs> yeah, a Schumpeterian approach, Actually, this is an accountancy system for something that has private property. And the instrument of accountancy cannot in any way mitigate or disappear this private property. Hmm. Yeah, um, my, my only suggestion was to open up your theoretical framework because Ostrom is particularly ill-suited for researching power and differentials. Uh, she takes this as a, as a given. Power is there and that's yeah. it. So my, I, I just have a simple suggestion to you uh, to include as well the power that derives from private property. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah, this is absent, and I think that it's definitely something you're missing. And the second suggestion would be, um, well, Schumpeter wrote about money just a few years before he died, so perhaps he he could not complete his ideas, but he does have this distinction between the social product the real stuff, yeah. land, labor, etc., and money, which is these units of account, the, the accountancy system. Um, and I think this distinction might help you also to complete your analysis. Thank you. Um, I wrote very briefly about this, um, and the other thing that I wonder, you say, yes, money does not delete these inequalities, uh, a social currency doesn't delete inequalities, but I am wondering if you also saw other negative actions and behaviors derived from having a social currency. Hmm. For example, arbitration between the communes and the euros or whatever, if this is possible, or any other, you know, people taking advantage. So it's not just about not mitigating ill behavior of the capitalist system, but also adding to not just reproducing, but also adding. If you have seen anything like that. I didn't. So you're talking Sorry about I took so long. <laughs> so thank you for the suggestions. i look into them. Uh, my argument, I think it is, one, it is that actually the power that comes from private property in the conventional system is translated into the community system and so reproduces power inequality inside the community system or community economy, if you want. So that's, um, the, I'll look deeply, more deeper into Schumpeter. It's an old, an old friend that ha I haven't visited for a long time. And then other, yeah. Okay. Uh, 
uh, and the other on other negative behaviors that come from the, maybe the free riding problem, uh, Miguel Angel again, calls them the ninja users, those that come in, use, uh, buy as much as they can as the, as the debit limit, and then disappear from the, from the, from the system, right? This particular currency is very small. It's quite, and so they know each other pretty well. So there were a few instances, but they were not big balances, and, and they were way far apart in time. So it wasn't really a problem for this particular currency. Uh, maybe, I don't know, you can talk to some, but I, I know from, other, from talking to other currencies that this, this is actually something that concerns many, many, um, yeah, currencies, local currency systems. She's had a hand okay. up from the beginning. I don't know. Mary, do you want to? Is it on topic? Just ignore me. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> okay. Some people have said that your questions before haven't. So I... uh, there are two ways that uh, we thought of, uh, not that we've been able to put them into practice, but at least the theory is there. It's on the Let's Think UK website. Um, uh, it, it's about creating a fund. Our software, and, uh, we're using local exchange, mm -hmm. and if some people are not able to give back because they're ill or dying, and uh, uh, you can set up a social fund mm -hmm. so that people can <coughs> earn currency from doing the visiting or caring, social care, because our the system of social care doesn't, it only stretches to yeah. feeding and cleaning. It doesn't stretch to social interaction. So it could complement what the authorities provide. Yeah. And then uh, I yeah. also thought that we could engage with, we're not engaging with outside, uh, with, with the um, mainstream systems, but we could befriend mainstream systems and say, for, the, for your patients or clients, or inmates who don't have any visitors, we can send people to come and take them for, well, we can pay them yeah, for that, our yeah. fund. So we can have our own kind of notion of social services within the community currency, hmm. which is actually quite good for people who don't know what to do, who say they haven't got any skills or aren't giving back. You say, why don't you take yeah, part in yeah, this? Yeah. It's an outing, it's yeah. a social activity. Yeah. Is that on topic? The Balaga Commune had a fund. Actually, a community fund, they call it, yes. for these kind of things. Yes. For paying the person that always writes the meeting minutes at the General Assemblies, that job that nobody wants to do. They pay him or her with a community yes. fund yes. for yeah, doing these kind of activities. Yes. Exactly. And you have to have a fund manager to look after yeah. the and all that, so that's another job. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. It's five after four. Just want to give the next speaker enough time. Um, so that next speaker is... Clara, is that right? Yes. And Clara will be speaking on uh, her, the subject of her presentation is design thinking and gamification as strategies to build a social virtual currency for adaptive health, healthy habits promotion in the workplace. Thank you, Clara. Sorry. User, uh, no, I just downloaded, mm -hmm. but I was in download uh, folder, but I, 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 I cannot find uh, this or this. Does anyone know where the downloads folder is in a Windows operating system? Uh, I don't know. I just. 
an ordinator. Okay. Um, yeah, but but it's a folder for this room. Okay. <laughs> I saw one folder for this room, but I don't know my presentation there that I can't find. One, oh, Salah. Uh, yeah, yeah, Salah. Salah? Salah, I think so. Uh, uh, downloads, I don't know. Should it be? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. Where are downloads? Anyone knows it better than me, then please. <laughs> Uh, it should be under the users, users, no? User public or maybe public. Why don't you go straight to the internet? Yeah, I don't know. You can find which folder is. Ah, in the browser. Ah, ah okay. I see. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I saw yeah. where, mm. where I, uh, are you here? Okay. So you don't need it. <laughs> yeah. Close, I don't know. <coughs> okay. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to talk to two methodologies, one methodology and one technique to design a social virtual currency. It's, it's an application for the health sector. Is that we are going to, to build a social virtual currency to promote active breaks in, in the university, in the employees, in the university. My university is uh, Universidad Autónoma de Bucaramanga in Colombia. Okay, this uh, currency we, we call UNAB Wellness Coin is a, a social virtual currency to promote the realization of adaptive healthy habits uh, in UNAB workplaces. Why adaptive uh, uh, healthy habits? Because uh, people can make those active breaks in a personalized way. So the system is going to prepare which active breaks are uh, better for one person or another person, uh, depending on the 
characteristics of the health attributes of, of persons. Uh, this is going to, to empower the UNAP Saludable program, that is a program that I have my university to promote the health, uh, the healthy habits in the university. Okay, the rewards for being healthy people that uh, make active breaks the university will uh, receive rewards for that that are uh, as good services or deals and fun opportunities in a well-being SMEs network of Bucaramanga City. Oh my God. Sorry. about the source or something like that. Sorry, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> and I can put my, my computer with this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. As a result of the technical difficulties, we'll go all a bit longer with the presentation. Okay, say 10 or 15 minutes longer then. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay.
Ok, sorry. Well, uh, then people, the employees, are going to receive uh, some rewards for the effort for being healthy in the university. And some rewards are like good services, deals, and fun opportunities in a well-being SMEs network of Bucaramanga City. We are going to build that network. At this moment, it's just the process is just in design. So I, I don't have a, a final product. I am going to show the, the, the phase of designing this, uh, this uh, system. Okay, then the motivation. The motivation to create this uh, currency is to engage the user, to maintain the program at the time, to produce a behavioral change, to make the digital experience more fun and trustworthy in, in people, and retain the audience over time. This is why, because uh, organizations has, um, have many programs that, that, that uh, start to, to, to cover the, the occupational health and to produce many strategies that for, for people to, to be healthy. But those uh, strategies are not so uh, continuous, some just for moments, and we need something that engage people and that the, the, the strategy be uh, for all day. So we, are, uh, we work with these three areas of knowledge. Uh, the occupational health, is the, the World Health Organization guidelines determines areas of interest in occupational health. So all organizations have to implement in the, in, inside some programs to, to, for this occupational uh, health to maintain, okay? Uh, for the UNAP, we have the UNAP Saludable Program that makes some uh, uh, strategies and design uh, already, they have one politica, political to, to conduct the strategies to maintain uh, uh, people, to maintain the health at, at the workplace. Uh, especially, the, these strategies are oriented to reduce the coronary heart disease, the obesity, hypertension, and, and joint problems. And uh, the, the idea is the implementation of active breaks in daily activity, appropriation of habits for eating healthy, etc. But for this prototype that we are going to, to implement uh, at the beginning, we are just going to use active breaks. Later, we are going to implement some other uh, uh, strategies like habits for eating healthy and something like that. The, the idea is that people engaged in these activities are going to receive a reward yeah, for being healthy. Uh, technologies and methodologies focus on the user. Which are those methodologies? Design thinking, that is design centered in the user, and gamification, is to, to, to use game mechanics in order to motivate people uh, to, to make uh, the, the active breaks in easy way and in, in intuitive way. Okay, what is, uh, sorry. Sorry, the other uh, area is the sustainable social economy. That we have combined social, social economy and, and sustainable economy. It's all the ability of an organization to function at a defined level of social well-being and harmony indefinitely, or the ability of our economy to support a defined level of economic production indefinitely. And the medium for this, in this case, is the social currency that describes the resources and abilities created and made available to a community through online or offline networks. I, its value is derived from the interaction of the community. So the, the, the effort that the community uh, uh, have, or, uh, 
give to the, to, to the, to the system are compensated with goods and services created a strong tie between producers, purchasers, and consumers of the products of a locality. Okay, that's the technologies. And what is then design thinking? It allows identifying comprehensive and real needs of the user for inclusion in the application design. So it's to, to involve people in the process of designing the, the, the application. So not just we that they are the technological people, but everybody that are going to receive the benefits of the application to involve in the design. And uh, help people and organizations become more innovative and more cre creative. The, the idea is just to, to change the way of designing, for example, this is an application, this is a mobile application. It's going to monitor all the activities by a mobile application, it's an app. So the design of that software is not going to follow the software development phases that are so rigid and that we are just to put the prototype or the application when that application is already finished. At this moment, we did with design thinking, we construct and we try with people to interact with the application and the feedback that people carry out with that interaction are, are going to, is going to uh, improve the, the application. So the design thinking uh, has these five phases. The first one is the empathy. It allows knowing people and users. So we, we uh, define the following elements to know people. Who are the beneficiaries of this strategy? The UNAP program, okay, the UNAP, the UNAP uh, saludable program, but we have to study uh, uh, by interviews or an, the analysis of the UNAP uh, saludable program and the interviews to people, to employees, to know how, uh, how uh, they uh, uh, take care of the health in the workplace. So at that moment, we have to ask or just to observe what is the, the attitude from, uh, in front of this uh, help, uh, uh, the help and in the workplace, and then take notes and to, to construct a document to analyze those characteristics. So the indicator, for example, the expected product of this first one, that is, uh, is the first objective of this uh, step is to design the guidelines for the establishment of the Active Lakes uh, program in the UNAP community, considering the measured variables of occupational health. Okay, then, uh, once analyzed that program, then we are going to analyze, to characterize the people, the, the UNAP community. We are going to orient this strategy to teachers, administrators, and graduate students that passed uh, too much time sitting at the desk. So the, 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 the idea is to stop each two hours and to make, and to induce to make a, a, a active break. And to make the active break, they are going to receive for that effort some uh, rewards. Okay, uh, the medium for the characterization of people are interviews and or the analysis of uh, database that the human resource department uh, has in the university. So the result is that database with those characteristics of people or the employees. Okay. Uh, then, uh, okay, analyze the current uh, routine that people has, uh, have, for, for, for being healthy. Uh, and finally, identify digital and citizen competences in the UNAP community for measuring levels of ICT incursion and skill for social collaboration. This because we identify that uh, for us, for our context, people don't like to work collaboratively. So are so uh, uh, isolated, uh, they are independent and they don't want to work 
uh, together. So we are going to measure that and to create strategies to, to make the collaboration the medium for, for, for the, the Okay, this is the first, then to identify. Then the second, the, that is the empathy, to identify all the characteristics. The se second step is the definition, permit the clear identification of the problem. Our problem is the lack of motivation strategies of the UNAP Saludable Program to enable the UNAP community to perform active breaks. Is that, there are not any uh, uh, motivation strategies to maintain the, the routine. And the solution is ensuring the active brain realization by means of motivator science enabled by through ICT. ICT is like a, an application way. The third uh, phase is the ideas. It enables the ideas creation for the solution implementation. So we have the base, so design the ideas for the application. The participation of the, all the product designers with the community will help this uh, uh, to create a solid uh, uh, system. And finally, we uh, develop the prototypes, allow the execution of the solution, include the design of the technology according to the ideas step and the proof of concept. So we have to put the application to start working with people, and then we collect information to the evaluation. So we have uh, these elements, and finally, we have the evaluation processes. One, the prototype was collecting data by means of the interaction of people. We measure the system performance considering the dimension defining the product design, and we measure to, as this resource is supplied and quasi-experimental with the qualitative and quantitative approach because we are going to measure if the health of people are good <laughs> with this practice, and we are going to measure also if the institution, um, uh, the, the uh, reduce, for example, the down, uh, okay, it's stop that people don't seek, don't be sick because it's, they have a health occupational problem. That those kind of, of measures. Okay, that's his characteristics. And uh, finally, the idea was that uh, an approach to design by means of design thinking, a social virtual currency uh, for motivating the UNAP community to regular realization of active breaks in order to improve the occupational health at workplace. The process was very important because allows to consider the needs of all the stakeholders as part of the solution. Um, currently, we have the very clear idea to develop the, the prototype at this moment. We are in that way, in that, in that phase. And uh, we expect that the feedback that people are going to give us, we are going to improve, improve our solution. At, at this moment, we are creating the business model of the network of SMEs of uh, well-being uh, uh, states in order to support the, the rewards that they're going to give to, to people. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Okay, questions? We have 10 minutes or less. because uh, we have coffee break going on now for those who want to. What I didn't understand is who, who, who is issuing this virtual uh, money? And the second question is, what can the users do with this money? Can they buy something or do they get a reward if they have some, some, some points collected? Yeah. yeah. Uh, people are going to win money just for the for for making uh, active breaks so they are going to buy the money for to start the 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 network you know they are going to win because they are going to make the active breaks 
Yes, I, I just wanted to stress and invite for a further cooperation with the University of Sao Paulo. We are right now using exactly the same tools, thought uh, framework, thinking framework, with design thinking, a multidisciplinary team with the Institute of Psychiatry of the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Sao Paulo. And we also have another project engaging uh, universities from Colombia. Mm -hmm. So let's talk. We have lots in common, and I am a really a very firm believer in the process of gamification and how this can be a leveraging a movement or a leveraging trend for social and complementary currencies. Now, the one thing that uh, I would like to provoke uh, is uh, what is your perception of the affective dimension? Because we are usually, and I think it's uh, inevitable, but we are usually attracted to the mechanics of gamification, let's say, as the literature defines it, the gam gamification as a special type of mechanics. But uh, as you said, in design thinking, the first dimension is empathy. Mm. So how should we treat empathy not as the starting point, but, m but maybe as the returning and recurring flow of all information that must revalidate or re-legitimate itself via empathy and the affective dimension of games? Yeah. Uh, I think that this, like uh, you say, that like it's, a, it's a cycle. Uh, if they can see the effects of the the results of that experience, they are going to be motivated. I, I think that the strategy is going to work. Okay. Just want to stress the word used. They want to see. People must see. So the iconic or visual or audiovisual dimension of value is really very, very important when we design for empathy, I think. So I I'm, uh, just wanted to stress that seeing or the the narrative is the constitution of this circular feedback process. Uh, yeah, right? Because they are going to have your own account that they are going to, to see the advance of the health, uh, the healthy habits. You know? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyone else? Does anyone else have a question? If not, then uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you Clara. very much. Thank you everyone for attending the session. It's coffee break right now until five o'clock and then the next session will start here after that. So thank you very much for being here this afternoon.